Good morning. We are in my working lair. Oh yeah. And by calm down. And by popular demand, I'm going to do a legal analysis of an episode of Suits. It's not going to be a full episode, however. It's actually just going to be two scenes which blew my mind with their legal inaccuracies and absurdities. The episode is Bailout from season one. It is the court scene where, uh, I'm gonna forget the guy's names, but where the lawyer is being sued by a taxi driver who got into a fender bender with the lawyer's driver. And the taxi driver is suing for, where's my coffee? <sighs> And the taxi driver is suing for millions of dollars for vicarious liability for having lost the opportunity to get uh, down to where they sell the taxi medallions to buy his own taxi medallion. The rationale being because he had a loan to get the monies to purchase the medallion and because he'll have to wait until next year, he may not get the same loan to purchase the medallion. So much absurdity in one sentence. Let's just start watching and um, comment as we go, shall we? Okay, so the first thing, yes, courthouses are dreary and windowless. The lighting is pretty good for this courthouse, however, I must say. Usually the lighting is a much yellower neon, but people are not sitting there buffering the floors during operating hours. I must warn you that representing yourself at trial is not the... What's he doing here? You think you can schedule a meeting without me knowing it? I don't know. I'm privy to all communication between you and the court. Nobody has one-on-one -on -one communications with the judge without the other party being present in the absence of some dire emergency. It is inconceivable that a party would be before a judge making any form of representation whatsoever without the other party being present. It's inconceivable. It is a violation of the most fundamental rule of justice, which is that nobody gets to make communications to a judge without the other party knowing about it. That's called corruption. But let's keep going here. Well, if your driving matched your legal knowledge, we wouldn't be here. Your Honor. This case should be dismissed. It's a matter for insurance. Uh, you notice the way the judge looks down when... Is it Harvey? I forget his name anyhow. When the lawyer goes to shake his hand. I should probably get their names if I'm going to actually do this properly. Hold on one second. Okay, it is Harvey. You notice how the judge looks down when Harvey goes to shake his hand? Judges don't like being touched by counsel. Insurance only covers repairs. It does not deal with my losses. What losses? Because of that accident, I, I missed my chance to get my taxi medallion. Can't just buy it next year? The loan I got expires in one week. Pay attention to this. The loan I got expires in one week, and I'm going to come back to this when the same individual is making representations before the jury, but let's get there. On top of that, a medallion costs 300000 this go-around. Next year, 350000 So his entire claim rests upon the assumption that he would have won this year's medallion. Oh. Not only that, but that by virtue of having lost this year's medallion, he'll have to pay $50,000 more for it next year. If he is only able to get it next year, he's going to pay $350,000 for it. Not a multi-million dollar lawsuit. His actual loss is only the $50,000 differential between what he could have gotten it for this year and what he will have gotten it for next year, assuming he gets it next year for the actual amount. Who knows? Maybe the medallions are going to take a dive in prices like they did in Quebec when Uber started operating and nobody's going to want to buy medallions. Maybe he'll be able to get his medallion for $250,000 next year. Maybe he'll be thanking Harvey Specter for the car accident next year. <laughs> America is that the little guy gets to see justice done. We are all equals in the eyes of the law. That is why out of all the countries in the world, I chose to come here. What do you have to say about that, Counselor? Ask yourself now what is going on. Are these guys pleading in front of the judge? There are two things in court. You have your courtroom where you can plead in front of a judge and you can have a judge in chambers. So you can have, this is at least in Quebec. I don't know if it's the same terminology elsewhere, but typically you schedule hearings in front of a judge in court. That's how it works. You don't go to plead in front of a judge in chambers unless there's some sort of dire circumstance, situation of emergency, where you have to actually get in front of a judge on such an urgent basis that you can't wait for a hearing in court. All courts, at least in Quebec, have a judge sitting in chambers even when the courts are not open in case there's an emergency. So. I don't understand what's going on here. This judge is not behind a desk as he would be in a courtroom. It looks like it might be in chambers, which doesn't necessarily mean the judge's office. It could just mean a room reserved for the judge who's sitting in chambers to hear emergencies. What are they doing and what are they pleading in front of him? What is the judge here supposed to be listening to? Vicarious liability applies to discrimination, harassment, and accidents. Employers are responsible for their employees' negligence. 
So as far as the concept of vicarious liability goes, it is relatively accurate, a description of vicarious liability, which is the theory uh, pursuant to which an employer can be held liable for the actions, wrongful negligence of his or her employees. The rationale being that the employer is the one who hired, manages, supervises, trains, and profits off of the employee. So if an employee does something wrong or has an accident or causes damage in the context of his or her employment, the theory of vicarious liability is that the employer can be held responsible on that basis and it's logical and it makes sense and it's it applies so there there's your lesson in law from this episode court finds a reasonable suit here trial starts tomorrow trial starts tomorrow every lawyer's brain should be exploding at the absurdity of that turn of events let's just let's just think about this one second trial starts tomorrow how are they going to get witnesses? How are they going to prepare? How are they going to prepare jurisprudence? How does the court system even work in that jurisdiction that they have a room available for the trial tomorrow? It's, it's crazy, but it gets crazier because I know where this is going. So let me just uh, deal with one thing that I find particularly funny right here. You're getting a good kick out of this, aren't you? I am. And now we continue with exchanges between one party and the judge in the absence of the other party. Outlandish. Absurd. I'm taking this on its merits. Oh, the judge is taking this on its merits? First of all, we're going to find out that this is a trial by jury, so the judge doesn't take it on its merits. But what is that even supposed to mean? Is a judge ever not taking a trial on its merits? Let's keep going. Keep going. You better bring your A-game tomorrow, because he's got a legitimate claim. He wants a trial? I'll give him a goddamn trial. Your Honor. Just, just, there's nothing. There's no words. It's entertainment. Mr. Santana, your opening statement, please. Oh, looky, looky, trial by jury, called yesterday. Uh, I was actually called for jury duty and I was so excited and then I realized that I couldn't do it because I'm a lawyer and lawyers, for whatever the reason, can't actually sit as jury members, which seems very counterintuitive, but whatever. Jury duty. The process of jury duty in and of itself takes weeks. They summon hundreds of people to the courtroom so that they can be interviewed as prospective jury members. Both parties get to examine witnesses and find causes for which they should be dismissed as potential jury members. I believe each side has a certain number of uh, just objective striking of a prospective jury member that they can use. Then you have to summon all of the jury members so that they know when they're coming so they can actually know how long the trial is going to be, what they have to do to manage their personal lives while they are sitting as jury members. So. Coupled with the fact that the judge the night before says he's taking this trial on its merits when it's actually a trial not in front of a judge, but in front of a jury. Okay, suspend disbelief. Let's just keep going here. Ever since I started, I look forward to a time when I could tell customers that they were writing in my cap. So I scrimped and I saved until I finally had enough put away to buy a medallion. Remember when the taxi driver was in front of the judge and he said that he took out a loan and the loan expired in a week so he wouldn't be able to get the medallion a year later because the loan would have expired? Can't just buy it next year. The loan I got expires in one week. And yet in front of the jury, the taxi driver says he scrimped and he saved in order to get enough money. I scrimped and I saved until I finally had enough put away to buy a medallion. Which one is it? You lied in front of somebody. Was it in front of the judge or was it in front of the jury? Unfortunately, we'll never find out because the case settled, but uh, let me get back to the rest of the video now because I just forgot to mention that part. Because of the actions of these men, I've lost that opportunity. At least in Quebec jurisdiction, the courts are very reluctant to recognize loss of opportunity as a damage resulting from a fault. The reason being that it is so difficult to assess or even objectively quantify, oh, had it not been for this, I might have gotten this contract. An interesting side note, uh, Chiesa, now the UFC fighter, is suing McGregor for effectively at least one header of his claim is loss of opportunity. And the argument is that because of what Conor McGregor did, which was throwing the dolly through the bus window and it scratched Chiesa's eye and he had to back out of a fight, he lost his opportunity to a title fight which would have paid x y and z you see how it works with this loss of opportunity there's a sequence of events that the damage is predicated on and it's difficult to prove that all of those sequence of events would have occurred in that order resulting in the actual amount that is serving as the basis for the claim of the loss so make no mistake this trial is not about a busted headlight this is a trial about a broken dream statements are like free throws easy nobody's playing defense this is relatively accurate. Opening statements are easy. They're like free throws. Nobody's playing defense. In Quebec, in the civil system, at least in my experience, not much emphasis and value is placed on opening statements because, I mean, imagine getting in there in front of a jury of 12 people and making a grandiose statement which is itself based on all of the facts that have not yet been adduced or even accepted as facts. It's basically like you're telling a story to set up the groundwork for the evidence that's going to be adduced during the trial, but you're making the statements in a factual void where the jury 
jury members or the judge haven't seen any of the evidence to even know what you're talking about. Typically, in my experience, judges keep the opening statements to summarizing the case in a nutshell and then get to the evidence. I haven't seen grandiose opening statements like this, but I do imagine they occur perhaps more in the American system and certainly more in the criminal justice system. But the reality is, yes, when you get to speak without anybody challenging you, it's very easy to build a very favorable case until opposing counsel comes in and starts picking it apart, as Harvey Specter is going to do right now. Are we good at defense? You would agree that chauffeur drivers cause more accidents. Objection, badgering, sustained. Well, first of all, you would agree that's not badgering. The basis of that objection should be asking an opinion of a witness of fact. You would agree that I'm not here to testify on statistics or provide an expert opinion on who causes more accidents. I'm only here to tell you what I did the day of the accident. Objection, argumentative, leading the witness. Objection, leading the witness. You are allowed asking leading questions to a witness that you are cross-examining, specifically because they are not there to assist you, and you are there to cross-examine them, to check their story, and to challenge them. So you are allowed asking the other party's witness in your cross-examination leading questions. Again, accuracy points. No. Ambiguous. Privilege. Inflammatory. Sustain. Your Honor, I would like to call to the stand Mr. Michael Ross, please. Mr. Michael Ross, please. <laughs> He's calling Michael Ross to the stand. Co-counsel with Harvey Specter. There's a principle in Quebec law, and I suspect it has to be the same in a great many other jurisdictions. A lawyer cannot testify in his or her own trial. That is grounds for disqualification of that lawyer or law firm from the trial. So what's going to happen here? The taxi driver is going to call Michael Ross up to testify, and Harvey Specter is going to cross-examine his own colleague. It doesn't happen in law. They would have to either disqualify the firm, or if the firm were allowed to continue acting in a file which there would be seemingly a conflict, which is one where a lawyer is going to be called as a witness in his or her own file, they would have to call in another law firm to participate in this cross-examination and then they would continue acting in the file as a whole. So again, this is preposterous. No objection, no objection to calling my colleague as a witness in this file. Accuracy rating zero on 10, negative 10 on 10. And calling surprise witnesses before you get to trial. In order for the court and the judge to know how long the trial is going to last, you have to identify your witnesses, who they're going to be, what they're going to testify on, how long they're going to testify for. You just fly by the seat of your pants when you get in there and call whoever you want. Although, that being said, at least in Quebec, anyone who is present in a courtroom can be called as a witness to testify. So unless Mr. Benghazi made up for that lost time, you were going to be late for that meeting, correct? So unless Mr. Benghazi made up for that lost time, you would have been late for that meeting. Objection, hypothetical question. It's not what happened. I'm not here to hypothesize on what might have happened. Who knows what might have happened? Maybe I would have called in. The meeting would have been postponed 15 minutes. Harvey Specter should have objected. Hypothetical question, impermissible. Keep going. Yes. Ugh. And Harvey Specter nodding at Michael Ross. Do you know what would happen from a lawyer coaching a witness during the trial, telling the witness how to answer? <laughs> what color was the light? I take the fifth. Can't take the fifth, Mr. Santana. This isn't a criminal case. Okay, so that's relatively accurate as well. The pleading the fifth or uh, the right to avoid self-incrimination applies during a criminal suit, not during a civil suit. But there's nothing more susceptible of building credibility than refusing to answer a question in a suit that you brought. What color was the light? What color was the light? What color was the light? This is our A Few Good Men moment. You can't handle the truth! This is beautiful. Oh, God, he's having his breakdown. He's having his breakdown. Your Honor, answer the question, Mr. Santana. It just meant so much to me. The spontaneous confession. Case closed. Harvey Specter, you're a god. We can roll the dice with the jury, but I'd rather settle. How much do I have to pay? How <laughs> much do I have to pay? That's how good negotiations start off. Uh, I think they're hammering the loss a little too hard right there for, um, for dramatic purposes. In return, I waive my right to collect legal fees. So interesting thing, in Quebec, if you can believe it, getting your legal fees paid by the opposing party when you win or when their case is dismissed or when they lose is excessively rare and abides by a very high threshold of proof in that you have to prove that the action was malicious, abusive, and whatever. As a rule, one does not get one's legal fees paid by the losing party in Quebec. It's a good and a bad thing, but um, it's very much different than other jurisdictions and certainly different than the states. A lot of lawyers don't like that because there is no real, call it an immediate penalty for taking an ill-founded 
suit on its face. You need a judge to declare the suit abusive or manifestly ill-founded or vexatious in order to get your legal fees paid back by the losing party. But such is such is the province. That goes for you too, judge. Reprimanding the judge. Accuracy negative 100 on 10. And here's my favorite part, by the way. If your cell phone goes off in a courtroom and you have a cranky judge that day, you will be held in contempt. You could be you could be sanctioned there on the spot. Turning off your cell phone in a courtroom is probably the most important thing, especially if you are counsel. No excuse for the cell phone going off. I was in court once and I genuinely felt bad because the person whose phone kept on ringing was clearly an older person who didn't necessarily know how to turn off or make their phone go on airplane mode and they were counsel. Holy cows, it kept on going off and then the judge said, is it off? And the person said, yes, and then it went off again and then the guy, I mean, was banished from the courtroom for a little bit of time, uh, as in like an hour that day. But it was hilarious for everyone in the courtroom, mortifying for the lawyer. So that's it, that's my assessment. I'm gonna give this uh, seven on 10 for entertainment and I'll give it a two on 10 for accuracy if only because the element on vicarious liability was accurate and there was something else that was relatively accurate. Oh yes, pleading the fifth, that is all. <sighs> okay, now I got to edit this, get on with the day. The kids are upstairs uh, eating breakfast. Like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell. I'm gonna be doing more of these. I'm not sure how much further I can get into Seuss because it's sort of driving me crazy. The show is fiction. I'll take requests, let me know what you want. Peace out. Thank mm -hmm. you.